Well, today we're in chapter 44. I was going to take you into chapter 45. Today we're in chapter 44. I couldn't get to chapter 45. And a good portion of what we're going to be looking at is going to be found in the first few verses here in chapter 40, 44. I chose to, to entitle this particular installment of our verse-by-verse -verse study of Ezekiel, uh, simply mark well uh, who may enter. And you're going to see why I, I chose that in just a moment. But let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 44. We're going to read the first three verses and get into our study. Mark well who may enter. Ezekiel writes in chapter 44, verse 1, Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces toward the east, but it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it, therefore it shall be shut. As for the prince, because he is the prince, he may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord, he shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway and go out the same way. Now, I have to tell you, you know, early on in my ministry, there, were, there was an, an individual, a, a man who shared with me one day, he said to me, he said, you know, I come from a particular fellowship and I'm used to getting meat and you give a lot of milk, basically, is what he was saying. This particular chapter here really contains a lot of meat of the word. And, and I want to be very careful because I realize that as we look at Ezekiel, especially as we've been looking at the last few chapters, but the whole book really, it's really a book that is something that, that, that somebody who's been walking with the Lord for a while may be able to apply and get. And for those who, who may be younger in the Lord, it may be extremely difficult. And what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to, not because I'm so great, I'm trying to understand it myself. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to present it in such a way that it contains both milk and meat. And so as we get into chapter 44, I have to be honest with you, there are a lot of things here that uh, really would pertain to those who have been studying the Word for a long time and have, have a, a, a lot of questions that have been de developed over the years related to a certain things that pertain to the return of Christ and the temple and, and all of that. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you the Word in such a way that it's, that it's properly divided but also brings application. Much of what we're going to be seeing in the first several verses of chapter 44 are, uh, are verses that, that have a lot of information that I'm going to try and condense and, and, uh, and not become tedious with detail. And yet at the same time, as we get to the end of this particular chapter, uh, I, I think you're going to find that, that there's, there's something that he says that for me, really resonated, and that's where I'm going to spend some time making a concluding application. So as we go through this, let me give you a few things that will be of help to us to understand what's going on. And then hold on as we go through this, and we'll be trying to teach this passage as clearly as is possible. And, uh, and then as we get to the conclusion, preferably we'll find some application that will help us as believers to uh, leave this place better equipped for works of service. And so as we begin here, we need to remember that earlier in the book, earlier in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel had, had written concerning how the glory of God had departed from the temple. Now, you see that in chapters 10 and 11. And when we were in chapters 10 and 11, you saw that the departure of God's glory from the temple, God had stated that His glory would dwell there, but in Ezekiel, you see it now departs. When you look at chapters 10 and 11, you actually see that there's a progressiveness, if you will, as his departing, as he begins to depart. And, and, and we saw that what happened is, is, is God's, God's glory began to depart. And at, at first, Ezekiel points out that his glory paused over the threshold of the temple. And then you see that it is next mentioned as being just pausing over the east gate. And then by the time you get into chapter 11, verse 23, Ezekiel says that his glory departed from the Mount of Olives. So this glory, the glory of the Lord that had been there in the temple, the glory that is referred to uh, by theologians as the Shekinah glory of God, this glory that was, was first uh, experienced in the tabernacle and then later was experienced in the, the temple that Solomon built, this glory that had resided there with the nation of Israel, where God was meeting with the people there in the temple, has now departed. Now, I mentioned to you that, that His glory was not found or mentioned in the uh, temple reconstruction under Zerubbabel, that His glory 
was not present in the temple reconstruction uh, when Herod, during the time of Christ, had been working for 46 years on that temple. I mentioned to you that when the Antichrist has a temple that is built that he actually is going to occupy, that the glory of God is not mentioned as being in the Antichrist temple. The glory only returns when Jesus returns. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, then that temple will be rebuilt. And I mentioned to you that it's the Messiah who rebuilds the temple. You see that in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. You see, in the New Testament, you have a, a picture where Jesus in Matthew 24 speaks concerning the abomination of desolation that is going to be in the temple. And when you do your last day studies, you realize, of course, that the temple that uh, was, was in existence during the time of Christ was actually destroyed in A.D. 70 by Titus of Rome. And so when Jesus would go into that temple, that temple that Jesus went into had been destroyed. And, and so to this day, when you go up into the Temple Mount, there is no temple. But Jesus in Matthew 24 is speaking concerning it as, as being in existence at his return. So as we've studied our scriptures, we know that according to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, that there's going to be a covenant that is going to be made between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel. And uh, Bible commentators believe that the uh, covenant is going to relate to a rebuilding of the Jewish temple. You can go to Israel today and you can go to the Temple Institute there found in the city of Jerusalem and there are already plans for a rebuilt temple. They already have the garments of the priest and uh, priests have already been instructed and have traditionally been instructed in sacrifice and many things are ready for this temple to once again be in existence. But the problem is, is you have the Dome of the Rock there on the Temple Mount. And so we believe that there's going to be a treaty that is made with the nation of Israel that is going to satisfy the demands of both the, the Muslims who have the Dome of the Rock there as well as the Jews and that there's going to be a reconstruction of a temple and this temple is called the Antichrist Temple. Now that Antichrist Temple is going to be destroyed. There's going to be an upheaval. So when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he's the one who's going to be building the new temple. In Zechariah chapter 6 verses 12 and 13, uh, it reads, speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now, when it says here, uh, the man whose name is the branch, you need to remember that the branch is one of the titles of Christ. It's one of the names of Messiah. The title reveals the humble beginnings of, of Messiah and as well as his fruitfulness. And he's referred to as a branch because he comes from the line or the tree of David. That's why he's referred to as a branch. Jeremiah in chapter 23, 5 says, The days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And so this branch is Messiah. So the temple that is going to be rebuilt, a temple that has the glory of God, this temple is going to be rebuilt by Messiah. And when that temple is built, the glory of God returns. And so that's what we've been looking at, especially in chapter 43. So as we get into chapter 44, we continue with that. And he begins to say here in verse 1, he, he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary which faces toward the east, but it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened. No man shall enter by it, because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. And so Ezekiel is at what is called the outer gate. Now, I want you to see this. You notice in verse 1, it's called the outer gate of the sanctuary. Ezekiel is there at the outer gate of the sanctuary. This is the outer gate. This is not the eastern gate on the wall. This is the outer gate of the temple. And that's where the Lord walks in. That's where his glory returns. And notice in verse 2 it says it is closed because it honors the Lord's glory having returned through it. And the fact that the Lord's glory returned through this gate is only going to invest it with special sacredness. Now, this verse here, I have to be honest with you, has caused a lot of confusion for a lot of people because uh, much of what I was reading and what I've read in the past 
makes a statement that this particular outer gate here will make the statement that this outer gate is the eastern gate, which is on the wall. And with that in mind, they, they have made statements that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to return and enter into the temple in that fashion and all of that. And so when you go to Israel, for example, you will see that there is something called the eastern gate. We've seen this many, many times, of course, and, and as you're on the Mount of Olives and you're looking towards the, uh, the city of Jerusalem, you will see that there is a blocked-up gate, and uh, in front of that is a, a cemetery. And um, the Ottoman Turks in 1530 actually walled that up. They actually closed up that entrance in 1530 A.D. They placed that cemetery in front of it because uh, many believe that they do that to prevent the entrance of Messiah who would come through that gate. And so, in many times that we've been there, I've, I have heard and I've even shared that, that that particular gate is where Messiah enters in. Well, I don't want that confused with what's going on here. What's going on here is, is as he says in verse 1 here, it's the outer gate of the sanctuary that, is he, that he's speaking about. He's not speaking about the gate there on the wall. And he's speaking about the sanctuary gate, and this particular gate is where the glory of the Lord returns into that particular area. And so what happens is, is the Lord is speaking of how that will be closed because it has special significance because that's where the glory returns. He said in verse 2, uh, the Lord said to me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened. No man shall enter by it because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. Now, in verse 3, he says, as for the prince... Because he is the prince, he may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway and go out the same way. Now, some of you probably will say at this point when I begin to share this, that's more information than I really need, Pastor. But there are some that might be wondering about this, and therefore I'll just address this very briefly. I want you to see this. Notice verse 3, and I'm going to take a moment to do this. And that's no apology. I'm just trying to get you prepared for some information. It says, as for the prince, there's a lot of confusion about that. The prince. Many people believe that the phrase the prince is referring to Messiah. How many of you, I got to ask this. Anybody ever hear that, that the prince that's being spoken of here is Messiah? I'm speaking to myself. No, there's a few hands there going up. There are many who have been taught that, that this is in reference to Messiah. And it's not in reference to Messiah. That's the reason I'm bringing this up. And this for you who take notes, you might want to note this. The prince is a title that is used from this chapter all the way to the conclusion, with the exception of chapter 47. It's used something like 14 times. The prince. So many people have thought that this prince that has been referred to is Messiah who will enter in. Actually, that's not what's being spoken of at all. The prince here is speaking of a human ruler. And there are reasons why, and you're going to see this, but I want to lay the foundation now so when we go through this, you'll be able to see that. There are reasons why this is speaking of a human ruler. One is you're going to see in chapter 45 that the prince doesn't act out the role of a priest. He does not act out the role of a priest. You'll see that in chapter 45, verses 19 and 20. He doesn't offer sacrifices. But we know that Messiah does offer sacrifices. Psalm 110 verse 4 says, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Messiah is a priest who offers sacrifices, but this individual does not. This is a human ruler. Secondly, you're going to see that the prince offers a sin offering on behalf of himself. He actually makes an offering on behalf of himself. You'll see that in chapter 45 also in verse 22. He makes an offering of a sacrifice for himself. But Jesus, the Messiah, is without sin. He doesn't have a need to make an offering to purify himself. According to 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, John said, You know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. And so this prince who is spoken of in chapter 45 makes offerings for sin, for himself. Jesus has no sin. Also, a third thing, in chapter 46, verse 16, the prince has sons, which refer to physical, natural descent. Now, we are sons of God, but we became sons of God spiritually. 
not physically, not through physical descent. There's only one true Son of God, and that's Jesus, who is begotten by the Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And so, this one who's being referred to here actually has sons. He has sons who are physical sons. But we became a son of God, not because we were born as a son of God, but because we became a son of God through faith in Christ. See, you are not automatically born a child of God. When I was a young hippie, that's what we used to talk about. We would talk about God being our father. We are all children of God. It was the family of man. And we used to speak about that. We used to say that, yeah, you're my brother, you're my sister. We'd speak in that way to one another because we believed ourselves to be all children of God. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that I need to be born again to become a child of God. And that the way I became a child of God was when I received Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I was not automatically born again. I had to, through the will, of, through God's Holy Spirit touching my will, I had to open my heart up to that which is called the gospel and receive Christ and acknowledge my sin before the Lord, repent from it, and turn to Him. And in John's gospel in chapter 1, verse 12, it says, As many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. And so this prince, according to chapter 46, has physical, natural sons. We became sons of God through faith. Now, fourth, the prince actually worships God in chapter 46, but Jesus, as God, receives worship. Hebrews 1, 6 says, let all the angels of God worship him. Jesus Christ is worshiped by creation, by the angels, by those who have, have been created. He is worshiped by us because we are created. And so the way it works is that God is worshiped, but nowhere does it say Jesus worships God because Jesus receives worship himself. And so as you're looking at this, this prince is a human being. Now, when you look at this in uh, Ezekiel chapter 44, when it speaks of the prince there in verse 3, well, the question is, well, then who is he? Well, there's two basic possibilities. And some great commentators differ on this. I wonder how many of you have even heard of J. Vernon McGee. I mention him once in a while, J. Vernon. He's on every radio station in the world, I think. J. Vernon McGee. And um, J. Vernon believes very strongly that this is in reference to Messiah. And, uh, and there's good reason to believe that. He, spe he, he thinks that, um, rather, I'm sorry, that this is David, that this is speaking of David. You see that in Ezekiel 34, 23, and 24, where it says, I will establish one shepherd over them. He shall feed them my servant David. He shall feed them, be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. J. Vernon believes that this is David himself. But then... I have another commentator that I use that is, is very scholarly. His name is Charles Feinberg. And Charles Feinberg goes on the record to say that, that this is a, a descendant of David that is being spoken of. Uh, he would be representing Jesus. He has authority under Messiah. And it would serve to emphasize how Jesus is ruling and reigning on earth through this one who's appointed. And so, who is this prince? Well, some say that this prince is David. Others say he's a descendant of David. But whoever he is, he's ruling there under the authority of Messiah Jesus. Now, we'll go a little bit further here. Notice how it says in verse 3, the prince, as for the prince, he's, he is prince, he may sit and eat bread before the Lord. He will be there at the gate, but he's not permitted to enter in through that gate. He only has a, a ability to be there at that point. Well, verse 4 also he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. So I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. I fell on my face and broke my nose. No, I fell on my face, and the Lord said to me, I'm sorry, Son of man, mark well. See with your eyes, hear with your ears, all that I say to you concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all its laws. Mark well who may enter the house and all who go out from the sanctuary. Now, say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, let us have no more of all your abominations. When you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be 
in my sanctuary to defile it, my house. And when you offered my food, the fat and the blood, then they broke my covenant because of all your abominations. And you have not kept charge of my holy things, but you have set others to keep charge of my sanctuary for you. The nation of Israel had laws, rules, regulations. God had stated that there's a certain uh, class of people. They're the priests, the Kohen. They are the ones who are to enter in. They're the Levites. They were the ones who were supposed to be making the offerings, the sacrifices, and doing the things within the temple that pertain to services to the Lord. And what had happened is the, the nation of Israel had become very lax in that and had allowed foreigners, the uncircumcised in, in heart as well as in flesh, to go and to perform sacred duties. And God says, you're the one who did that, and God is, is blaming the nation of Israel for that. And he's saying, basically, you had apostate priests, people who were allowing others who had no right to, to make these offerings and to do these works. You allowed them into that uh, area that was reserved for the Kohen, who were reserved for the priest, and, and you allowed them to do work that was, was not their part. Now, these people are, are uncircumcised in heart and in flesh. Now, when he speaks of them being uncircumcised in heart and flesh, it's another way of saying that these are people who are not believers. These are people whose hearts are not right with God. You see, God's desire is for His, His glory to fill that temple. But in the past, in the history of Israel, they had allowed people to do works of service, and that's why God's glory departed. So as he's on his face, God begins to speak to him. And as God is speaking to him, he's saying to him, listen, you need to hear and you need to see and you need to do this clearly. And I want you to mark well those who may enter into the house. I want you to know who can and cannot enter in because God is extremely particular about who he allows to come and worship him there. And he's saying the sins of the past, Ezekiel, they're not going to be tolerated. Only those circumcised in heart may enter to worship and offer sacrifice to him. The foreigners he mentions are unbelievers who had been offering sacrifices, and he says this will happen no more. And so he's making it clear, your present condition is in great contrast to my future plans. Because at that time, Ezekiel, unqualified people are entering into the temple and they're making sacrifices. But when God is once again present, that will not happen. No longer will unqualified unbelievers be allowed to officiate in his temple. Now, somebody asks the question, why make a big deal about that anyway? So what? What if they're sincere? What if these are people who simply want to serve God? Is there something wrong with this? Well, the bottom line is, yes, there is. Because God had established regulations. Those regulations needed to be upheld. In his regulations, foreigners were excluded. They had no right to officiate in the temple in any way. And the sacrifices that were being offered were not just simple physical actions. The sacrifices were always an evidence of, of a heart that was filled with faith towards God. And when an unbeliever is going through that ritual, when an unbeliever is trying to perform sacred duties, God doesn't receive it. And that's why God was saying here, that will not take place in the future. It happened in the past, but it will not happen again in the future. We'll look at something else in just a moment as I continue. In verse 9, thus says the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. The Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers of the house and ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. They shall stand before them to minister to them. Because they ministered to them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore I have raised my hand in an oath against them, says the Lord God, that they shall bear their iniquity. And they shall not come near me to minister to me as priest, nor come near any of my holy things, nor come to the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. Nevertheless, I will make them keep charge of the temple for all its work and for all that, that has to be done in it. Unfaithful priests, apostates, will receive mercy, but they will not serve in the higher services of the priesthood. These whom he's referring to in verses 9 through 14 will have duties, but they will not partake in the more honorable duties because they had basically forsaken the right to because of their unfaithfulness. 
Now, he speaks of, in verses 15 and 16, the priests. Now, notice this. The priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary. And they shall come near my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. Now he's speaking of the legitimate priests, the ones whom God has set apart to minister before him. As we've been studying in, in uh, 2 Samuel, we see Zadok. We see he's a priest that was faithful to David, and he ministered during the time of King David. So what is he saying? He's saying only those who are faithful to the Lord come near to the Lord. Only those who have been faithful with the Lord to the Lord are going to have deep fellowship with God. If you take notes, this is a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what it says here. And I want to talk about this for a minute. The question is asked, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Who is the individual who's going to be able to ascend that hill and worship God? And he makes it very clear, the one who has clean hands and the one who has a pure heart. Over the years, I've had people speak to me and they say things like, I keep asking the Lord for help. I keep asking him, but for some reason it seems like heaven is brass or his ear is dull and he doesn't hear me. And as we begin to speak and as I begin to ask him what seems to be the problem and why do you have this sense, very often we get to the point where they begin to open up and, and before you know it, they begin to share with me that there are things in their life that need to be dealt with sexual sins, anger problems, alcohol, drug addictions, various habits of the flesh that have been keeping them in bondage, pornography, just a variety of things. And, and as we begin to speak, they will say that they're practicing these things, but can't understand why they don't seem to have that close fellowship with God anymore. And they, they forget that, that God loves them so much he, he doesn't want them to be caught in the bondage of a sin that interrupts the fellowship between them. And, and many times they don't want to forsake the sin. They want to remain in it, but they want to have God too. And, and, and Jesus said you need to be either cold or you need to be hot. But if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus taught us that we were to either pursue him with everything or don't pursue him at all. When you, when you read your Bible, especially like in Luke chapter 9 and various other places, where Jesus speaks concerning the, the call of the disciple and, and, and the cost of discipleship, it is never free. There are times when the Lord will say, go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor and come and follow me and you'll have treasures in heaven. And the individual that he speaks to goes away very sad and never follows Christ because, we're told, because his possessions were great. And so oftentimes what we see is we see people with a, a half-hearted allegiance to God who aren't really committed to him, who know better, who know that God's promises have been given to him in Scripture, but they, they don't want to embrace them by faith. And so what they end up being is miserable because they're not embracing the Lord, because they're not willing to let go of that which is killing them. Many years ago, I read about this professional wrestler, professional wrestler who had come from Europe. And this was many, many years ago. He traveled by steamship across the Atlantic. And he arrived in the United States and he had various wrestling exhibitions. He was a European champion. He was wrestling against American wrestlers and he was winning and he won a lot of gold. So when he finished his tour here in the United States, he got back on that ship and began to make his way across back to his home country. And, and as they were going across the, uh, the ocean, 
the ship began to sink. Now, what he had is he had all of his gold in dust, and he had it in a belt. And so he placed the belt around his waist, and he jumped overboard with his gold because he didn't want to give it up, and promptly sank to the bottom of the ocean and drowned. This was a man who wanted the gold more than he wanted his life. And there are people, I guarantee you, and some of you understand this because you've been there, who want to keep hold of what they have that is destroying them. They want to hold on to it. They're not willing to let it go because they're afraid of what God might have. They're not quite sure whether God has something better than what they already possess, and they don't want to let it go. And they live lives like an animal that's been placed in a cage who's unable to leave that cage because it's the only thing that it has, that it knows. Again, I heard of a man who had this rabbit, and he had a good-sized cage, but it was one of these rabbits that just can grow very large, and ultimately he kept feeding the rabbit, but the rabbit was never let out of the cage. And now that rabbit has grown to the degree that he is actually pressing along the sides of it. He's so huge. He's one of these Goliath-type rabbits. He's so huge that, that the man has to set him free. So he takes this huge rabbit, takes him out into the forest, opens up the cage door so that the rabbit can come out and be free. And the rabbit sniffs around and kind of comes out of that cage, works his way out the door, and, he, and this man's watching this rabbit as the rabbit sniffs the air. And in front of him is this entire forest that he can go and be free in. And as he's there, he's outside just a foot away from the door, from the entrance of that cage, a cage that he has to squeeze out of to get out of. And the rabbit just shakes his head, turns around, and climbs back in the cage because that's all it knew. It wasn't willing to step out into something that was greater. It's like the little boy who grows up in an area that's never been to the beach. And all he does on, on a hot summer day is he goes to the fire hydrant and turns the water on so that the water can flood the gutter so he and his friends can play in the water. No concept whatsoever what a beach is. No concept of what a clean lake is. All he knows is what he's grown up with, and what he grew up with was water in a gutter. And for him, that was fine. And a lot of people are like that. A lot of people are like that. They can't see beyond what they have right now, so they're afraid to release it. They're afraid to take what God has for them. They're afraid to have what God wants for them. And so they hold on to it. So the girl's living with the guy, and she knows that God says, I got something better for you. But she will not break up with him. She will not deal with it. She will stay with him, even though he's cruel to her, and even though he doesn't care for the things of God. She, she says, I'm going to stay with him no matter what. And that question has to be asked, why? It's because that's all she knows. And very often, that's the cage that she lives in. Who does the Lord want to enter into that place? Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands. He who has a pure heart. He who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. In other words, somebody who is saying, I'm going I'm to pursue God with all of my heart. And that's what the Lord wants from us. So these priests, these Levites, the sons of Zadok, they're ones who have remained faithful to God, and they're going to be used by God. Now, notice in verse 17. It shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. When they go out to the outer court, to the outer court, to the people, they shall take off their garments in which they have ministered, leave them in the holy chambers, put on other garments, and in their holy garments they shall not sanctify the people. So they're going to wear linen. Now this is straight out of the Old Testament. This is straight out of the, the, uh, the clothing of the priests that you find in, in the book of, uh, of Exodus in chapter 28. And so the linen versus wool, why is that important? Very basically this, because God doesn't want our sweat. God wants inspiration. He doesn't want perspiration. <laughs> when you serve the Lord, it's not a works effort. I think that's where a lot of people make some major mistakes is they want to clean up their own acts and then they want to present themselves to God. It just doesn't work that way. 
It isn't going to work that way because no matter what you do for yourself, it's never enough. There's no way that you can ever train yourself to become the best kind of sacrifice that God will receive. He doesn't require your, your perspiration. He doesn't require your efforts. He doesn't require me to do the very best that I can. My friend Nick, I have a friend I grew up with, lived down the street from me. And I got saved, and I hadn't seen Nick for some time. He had moved away, and I went to go visit him. And Marie and I were there visiting with this very old friend of mine. I'd known him since I was just a little boy. And, and there we are at his place. And, and um, as I'm talking to him, I, 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 I say, Nicky, I committed my heart to Christ. I'm following the Lord. I'd been doing so for a few years. And, and I said, I, I just got to ask you a question. And we were good friends. had been friends for many years and all grew up basically together. And now I'm in my early 20s. And I say to him, just need to ask you a question. When are you going to give your heart to Jesus Christ, Nicky? When are you going to give your heart to the Lord? You know you need Jesus. When are you going to give your heart to the Lord? And he looks at me, and as a good friend will, he says to me, well, David, I have been considering that. And he says, I'm going to give my life to God when, when I make myself good enough to give to him. And I looked at him as a good friend can say to another good friend, and I said, Nikki, you're an idolater. You're, you're, you're trying to do something that God has never commanded you to do. Nowhere does the Bible ever say, clean up your own act and then come to me. I said, the Bible uh, speaks about Jesus Christ going out to retrieve sinners and the lost. He goes out to the ones who have no ability. He goes out to the ones who are crippled, the blind. He goes out to the ones who are the lepers. He goes out to the ones who, in other words, have nothing to commend themselves to God. He goes after the ones who are lost, Nikki, and you cannot have a relationship with God if you try to make yourself good enough for Him. That's why you need Jesus Christ, because He makes you presentable to Himself. Nick, don't you see that? Jesus Christ came to save sinners, to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you are going to try to make yourself good enough for him, you will never give yourself to him because you will never be good enough for him. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. God is the one who causes us to have a relationship with him, you see. And that's how that works. And so linen garments are symbolic of, of service to the Lord that is not tainted by human effort and human perspiration. It is, it, is, it is symbolic of the fact that wool will make you hot, but linen doesn't. And therefore, you wear linen because your works for God are in response to the work that God's already done on your behalf, and therefore, you serve Him with all of your heart because it's the work of Jesus that purchases salvation, and, and it's simply by faith that receives that gift that God gives to us. Now, notice... He says in verse 20, they shall neither shave their heads nor let their hair grow long, but they shall keep their hair well trimmed. No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. They shall not take as wife a widow or a divorced woman, but take virgins of the descendants of the house of Israel or widows of priests. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean, in controversy, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws, my statutes, and all my appointed meetings. They shall hollow my Sabbaths. They shall not defile themselves by coming near a dead person, only for father or mother, for son or daughter, for brother or unmarried sister. May they defile themselves. After he is cleansed, they shall count seven days for him and... On the day that he goes to the sanctuary to minister in the sanctuary, he must offer his sin offering in the inner court, says the Lord God. Very briefly, avoid extremes. They will avoid extremes. Shaving the head or growing long hair were symbolic of mourning. So they're to avoid extremes. In verse 21, they're not going to drink wine because joy comes from the Spirit of God. In, in verse 22, they're going to have certain kinds of marriages because they're not going to be suffering through the, the stress of past relationships, basically. But I want to spend just a moment now, and this is where I want to make application because this is something that I was looking at in, in verses 23 and 24. This is where I'm going to spend the last several minutes and then I'll wrap it up. But I want you to see this because this really spoke to my heart today. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy. 
cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. In controversy, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed meetings. They shall hollow my Sabbaths. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy. And what is clean and what is unclean. They will be worthy and will be recognized as being teachers of the people of God. They will openly demonstrate to God's people what pleases or displeases the Lord. They will judge according to God's judgments, according to God's laws, and according to God's statutes. This is something that I've been thinking of. How do you discern? How do you know? How do you know what is good and what is bad? How do you know that? A friend of mine and I were sitting down just a couple days ago. We were visiting. And as we were sitting down and talking, a young father came walking by, and he had a little boy. The little boy was probably about, I'd say, four years old, no more than five. And Daddy was walking with the little boy, and they, they, were, they were in front of me maybe three feet. I mean, they were passing right by Randy and me. And, and I couldn't help but overhear the, uh, the father as he's talking to his little boy. His little boy's holding onto a stroller because the father's pushing a baby in a stroller with his little guy with him. And the father's speaking to this little boy, and he's saying to him, do you remember the other day when you did something bad? And the little boy was looking up at his father as they were walking. And I heard that man say that to his son. Do you remember the other day when you did something that was bad? And he said it right as he was passing by. And I look at the little boy. He's got to be four years old, no more than five, as he's looking up at his dad. And the little boy was saying, yes, as they passed by. And I have to tell you, that little conversation got me thinking. And I, and I talked to Randy about it later on. I said... I, I heard this man, I don't, you know, and he said to his little boy, do you remember when, we, when you did something bad? And I said, Randy, I said, you know, it made me think. It made me start thinking. What standard does that father have to teach his son right from wrong? Now, maybe he was a Christian. I don't know. Maybe he wasn't. How would I know? I don't know. I didn't stand there long enough to hear that or follow him I just heard that phrase, do you remember when you did something bad? And I spoke to Randy about that, and I said, this is really something that I think about. How do you determine what is good and bad? Who sets the standard? And, and in your house, in your house, and those of us who are believers, how do our kids know what is right and wrong? How do they know that? How do they know that? How do they know what is good, and how do they know what is bad, and who determines what is good and what is bad? And as I was talking to Randy, I said, you know the thing? I said, if I were to go back and to do it over again, I said, Randy, I made one big mistake, so I'm sharing this with you in the event that some of you may be able to correct the thing that I should have been able to do that I didn't do. I made some assumptions when I was raising my kids that I regret to this day. Some assumptions. I assumed that because my kids came to Bible study with me, I assumed because I gave them devotions every day of the week. You know, when my kids were small until they were in high school, until they were in high school, five out of seven days in the week, my children had Bible studies from their father, a pastor of this church. Five out of seven days. The other two days of that week, they came to church. They came to Sunday morning services, and they came to Sunday night services, and they came to Wednesday night services all their young life. I can stand before God, and I can tell you, I taught my kids Bible studies, devotions. I read biographies of, of missionaries to them. I did everything except one thing that I should have done, and that's why I'm sharing it with you. I did not have them memorize the Ten Commandments. That is your standard that I should have begun with. God's Word memorized, and I should have taught them why you have no false gods. I should have taught them why adultery is wrong. I never did. I made the assumption that because they got devotions, biographies, Bible studies, 
all of their life that they would naturally embrace that. And I discovered that some of the things that I so hold to, they never grasped. How do your kids know what is right and what is wrong? How? I'm not using myself as, as a measuring rod for you. And forgive me if it even sounds that way, because I'm not. But I think that just by telling you that I poured that much into the kids ought to be a challenge to all of us to do at least that. But how do they know what is right and what is wrong? What is good and what is bad? There's a man who's well known for taking surveys. His name is George Barna. George Barna took a survey recently of Americans who profess to be what are called evangelical, also referred to as born-again Christians. And according to his survey, after he went through it, evangelicals divorce at the same rate as the nation at large. 9% of evangelicals ever give to the Lord. Of 12,000 teens, evangelicals who pledged to wait for marriage before they would have intercourse, of 12,000 teens pledging to wait for marriage, 80% had sex outside of marriage in the last seven years, and 26% of those evangelicals do not believe that fornicating is wrong. Barna discovered that these all had one thing in common. They didn't think studying the Bible really matters. They didn't think the Bible had the answer. To them, the word doctrine was something that divided people. The word doctrine simply means teaching. But to them, doctrine only divides. And they say it really doesn't matter what you believe. But the result of thinking like that was they are no different in their behavior than the rest of the world. So they profess to be Christ-like. They profess to be Christians, these evangelicals. But you can't distinguish them from somebody who doesn't even know God because they don't think any differently. But on the other hand, there was another survey done, and it related to those who think studying the Bible matters. And it was discovered, quite obviously, that those who think studying the Bible and applying it matters, well, these are people who live differently. These people were found to be nine times more likely to avoid adult-only material on the Internet. They are twice as likely to volunteer time to help people who are in need. They are twice as likely not to watch a movie specifically because of offensive content. And 49% of these Christians with a biblical worldview have volunteered more than an hour in the previous week to an organization serving the poor, while only 29% of professing born-again believers had done so. And so the, the conclusion was teaching and applying God's Word matters. It matters because it changes lives. It matters because people are going to know that there is a standard that is not of human origin. It matters because when these priests are opening up the Word of God and saying, Thus saith the Lord, those people will know that these priests are worthy to be listened to because they're following God themselves. And when that temple is established, these priests will be doing that ministry and the people will be coming to them and they will be hearing the things that the priests have to say with respect, and they will put it to practice in their life, and as a result of that, they are going to be blessed by God. They're going to discover that, that teaching the truth and modeling the truth will help people to grow. They're going to realize that, that, that God actually blesses people's lives. And that's why I have to encourage those of you who have middle school children, junior high kids, you ought to be making sure that they go to the things that we have to offer them so their lives will be changed by the things of the, of the Lord, by the Word of God, because those things matter. Listen, if I didn't come to Christ, I have to say this briefly, if I hadn't come to Christ at the age of 20, I guarantee you my life would be absolutely different than it is today. There's no doubt about it, none at all, no doubt whatsoever. I already was extremely liberal, already. I didn't care about anything. Yeah, legalized pot, no big deal. Yeah, I think we ought to be able to drink at the age of 18, no problem. I mean, it doesn't matter to me if you live with your girlfriend. As a matter of fact, I'd love to live with a girlfriend if I could get one to live with me. 
I mean, I had no problem with that at all. None at all. Didn't think about it at all. Love, what is that? Doesn't matter. It's just a word. Use it to get what you want and move on. Who cares? It doesn't matter. If you don't like them, let them know. Why waste your time loving somebody that is so unlovable? Just let them know you don't like them and tell them to get out of your face and move on. And that's exactly how I was. I cared about nobody except me. After I got saved, I was in the kitchen with my mom. I'd been sharing with my mom about Jesus and how God can change lives. And as we were speaking, I was looking out the window there, and this guy was driving a sparklet truck. He was delivering water, and that's when they used to have the glass bottles, not the plastic ones. And this guy turned left in front of my house, went up the street, and when he did so, one of the bottles went flying out of his truck, hit the ground, splattered against the curb, this empty bottle. And I saw that happen as I was talking to my mom. I went and I got a broom. I went and got a bag. I went across the street. I swept it up, put it all in the bag, took it, threw it in the trash, came back in the house, and I said, okay, where were we? And my mom looked at me, and she said, something has happened to you. And I said, what? She said, David, that's not you. What you just did, that's not you. And I, I didn't get what she was talking about. But she knew what I would have been like. For me to go out and pick up the glass, are you kidding? That's not my glass, and I don't care if you cut your foot on it. You're stupid because you did. You should have seen it. That's how I thought. Little things. I am not kidding you. It's the little things. When I started taking my sister Madeline, who was 16 at the time, and my sister Rebecca, who was 14, when I would put him in my car with me and take him to Bible studies, what 20-year-old guy takes a 16-year-old sister and a 14-year-old sister and hangs around with them? Nobody does, unless he's got no friends. But for me, that was natural. And I taught them praise songs. I would sing with my sisters as we went to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I would praise the Lord with them. I took them to Bible studies. I told them about Jesus. I read the Bible to them. I would sit there with my mom and tell her about Jesus Christ. I did that. My life was radically changed. And that's what makes the difference. And it's all the Word of God. It's when you believe it. It's when you embrace it. It's when you say, I'm going to do it, that your life changes. And I have seen that in my own life. I encourage you in your own. And that's what the priests will do. The priests will teach the Word. I have such a struggle with churches today that are pastored by unholy men. I struggle with guys who will not open the Word of God and teach it. I was in a meeting with several pastors several years ago now, and the issue related to homosexuality, whether it's approved or not approved by God, was being discussed. And... I shared a few things with these pastors and with, with, uh, with some political officials about that. And this guy who was seated behind me said, right after I had spoken, he said, what's the big deal? He said, homosexuality is only mentioned a few times in the Bible. What's the big deal? And I turned and I looked at him and I said, how many times does God have to tell you until you listen? God only has to say it once as far as I'm concerned. He doesn't have to repeat himself. And if he says it more than once, it must be serious. You need to hear what God has to say. Now, people don't like me saying things like that. I'm supposed to be up here like a home on the range church. Never has heard a discouraging word. And they don't like it. They get people angry. But it's true. It's true. See, there's only one person that I really care about and how he feels about me, and that's Jesus. And I'm going to hear a well done, my good and faithful servant. That's my heart. And that's what I'm going to do. People don't understand that. Take it to the Lord. Because I believe that God's word is true. And I believe God's word, when taken by faith and acted upon, changes lives. And that's what God says to these priests. This is what you're going to do. You're going to use my word, my statutes, my ordinances. You are going to teach them to the people. They will come to you for judgments. You're not going to give them your opinion. You're going to give them my word. And when they have a controversy, we'll settle it by the word of God. And that's what they're going to do. And finally, in verse 28, it shall be in regard to their inheritance that I am their inheritance. You shall give them no possession in Israel, for I am their, pos their possession. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, Every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. The best of all the first fruits of any kind and every sacrifice of any kind from all your sacrifices shall be the priests. 
Also you shall give to the priest the first of your ground meal to cause a blessing to rest on your house. The priest shall not eat anything, bird or beast, that died naturally or was torn by wild beasts. God is their portion. God is their joy. And just knowing that is going to be their blessing. He says in verse 29 that they will live, these priests will live off the support of those who give. They will be supported as they serve. And God makes it very clear, and I want you to see this. He says, you shall give to the priests the first of your ground meal to cause a blessing to rest on your house. You give to the Lord out of faith. And God here is saying, as you give to the Lord, you're causing a blessing to come to your home. I think that because people are so caught up thinking, oh, you go to church and all they ever do is talk about money, that a lot of ministers, even like myself, get nervous when you start sharing about giving your offerings to the Lord. But I'm telling you this, when you give to the Lord, you give out of faith, you give out of joy. It's always out of faith that you give to Him. And as you give to the Lord, that is one of the most tangible acts of worship that a human being ever enacts. It's one thing for me, I did it for years, just to raise my hands and sway to the music and sing to God, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. It was another thing when I started putting my faith into action and actually trusting Him to provide for me for my, for my daily bread. It was an, another thing when I finally learned that I could never outgive God. And I discovered that God does bless you when you give to Him. And that's what the Lord is saying here. In Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, honor the Lord with your possessions, the first fruits of your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will overflow with new wine. Lord, I believe that you are going to provide salvation for me because your word says it. You said, if I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be saved. And I do. I believe that he died on the cross, and I believe that he was buried. I believe that he rose the third day. I believe that he ascended to heaven, that he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell those who by faith would receive when they confessed and repented. I believe all of that. I believe that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I believe that there's an event coming called the rapture, that you're going to take me to live with you and I'll be with you forever. I believe that. I just don't believe that you'll bless me when I give to you. And so I had to learn that that's just part of being a Christian, of trusting him in all things. And of all people in the world, the most generous are those who are believers, the most generous. Because we've discovered that giving is an act of faith, that God blesses us, and we can never outgive God.